Uh, me and Genji have been good mates for for years. So he's top bloke, and he was he was still a boy. Like he just signed for Bristol. We had a few issues with um, Andy Robinson. Uh, he came in. He was just sort of finding his feet, and then suddenly you come back and you expect it to be the Genji of old. You know, still that sort of a little bit immature. You know, but you come now and he's he's a real man. You know, he's he's got a kid now. Um, he's just matured a lot. All right then, Freddie Burns, friend of the show, but not just friend of the show, one of my best mates in the rugby world. So, Freddie, thank you for having us. You look very comfortable in that chair. Are you comfortable with a wry smile? And obviously, we can get onto it. I know you're not because I know you're a humble, grounded human being. What I'm trying to get at is basically breaking news this week in the world of rugby, especially in the English Prem. George Ford, teammate of yours, uh, is leaving Leicester Tigers to join the Sale Sharks. How's all that come about? How is the feeling at Leicester? Um, out the blue, shocked? Um, mate, it's a, it's, a, it's a weird one because, you know, it's a professional sport now. Fully expect players to, to, to leave. Um, obviously, ford has been um, exceptional for us at the start of the year and is, is a world-class player. So, to be losing that is, is a blow. Um, and to be losing him is a blow because he's great around the place. But, Obviously, for me, being a fly half playing in that position, it, it opens up opportunity for me potentially to, to take that 10 shirt um, next season when he moves on. So um, it's, a, it's a tough one, mate, obviously, for the state of the squad and, and wanting the best for Leicester Tigers. It would have been great if he was, if, if he was hanging around. Um, but obviously, from a, from a somewhat selfish point of view, in a way, it's, it, it could potentially open up an opportunity for me. So, um, you know, 40, someone who... Throughout my career, I've had I've had quite a big rivalry rivalry with, um, but now being able to work with him this year and you know bounce off each other, he's actually become a, a good friend. So I have a lot of respect for him. He wants to go back and play for his is an area in the country that he was born, back up north, close to home, close to his family, and no one can argue with that. So um, it's a blow for the club, but like I said, I've been away for a while, and I don't want people to forget that I'm still. Um, more than capable of stepping up and, and taking the club forward. No, you absolutely are, Freddie. And we'll come on to that as well. I just want to get a gauge on how someone as high profile, you know, top of the league, Leicester, best club in England at the minute, uh, how, you know, their star player being the fly half, as you know, Freddie, is generally the star uh, player and position in the team. Like, how does that come about? Does he get up in the group and stand up and announce he's leaving? Or does he do a Steven Gerrard ring these Rangers to go to Aston Villa and just literally smoke bomb out the place? Um, no, I think there's... Um, so he put a message on the WhatsApp group um, today before it all got announced. But it's a funny one, mate, because like, no doubt he'll be open and honest and, and speak to the boys. That's, that's how he is around the place. I mean, as to, to have spent this year with him, seeing how he is with people and how he demands the best out of people has been a good learning experience for me. Um, but, you know, with that, sometimes there is... Uh, different politics in rugby, you know, Sale probably putting pressure on to announce it. We don't really know when he told Steve that, that he was deciding to, to move on. So um, sometimes it's a day off for us today. So sometimes the best we can do is a, is a WhatsApp group message. Um, but like I said, Forty will be honest with the boys. And I think, no, no one knows when he made his decision, but judging those performances this year, you know, he's fully committed to the course and he will be for the rest of the season. So um, yeah, it was a WhatsApp group message, but, uh, it's one of those things, it's professional sport now. Then for you personally, we've obviously had chats off air and on air. We, we've, we've done a load of interviews, haven't we? But I think you were under the assumption, like a lot of us were, that Forney would be with England until the World Cup. And then your opportunity would lie at Leicester, at the, especially at the start when you were just back at the club, when he goes away with England. That hasn't been the case. Obviously, Forney's stayed with Leicester. He's been brilliant. You've had loads of opportunity as well. But where do you think it leaves yourself have you had a chat with Steve and said look mate don't go out there and get the checkbook out give me a shot are you thinking they might go out there and get the checkbook out and, and use you still in, in, in that role but how do you in a perfect world do you, do you want to see it unfold do you know what Jim it's um it's one of those now where like the club will do what the club needs to do Steve you know is a top quality coach he will decide whether he needs to go out into the market and get a 10 whether he's happy with you know myself Bryce Hegarty a lucky youngster like Dan Lancaster coming through. Um, and I'll be honest with you, Jim, I don't really care. Like, you know, I want the opportunity and I want to play, but at the same time, the club go and get someone. 
I'll just continue to do what I've done this year with with Ford, who's arguably the inform fly half in the country, which is train incredibly hard, train really well, and be ready for an opportunity when it comes. You know, I've I've not had my opportunity so far this year at 10 because of how Fordy's played and how the team's gone, and I fully understand that. But you know, I feel like I've been I spent a bit of time in Japan. I didn't play too much at Bath, and I don't want people to forget that, you know, I'm more than I'm more than capable and more than able of, of stepping up and and taking the, the club forward in, in years to come. But in terms of Steve's decisions, the club decisions, whatever they do now, mate, I'm I'm 31. You know, I know how I go about my business and conduct myself. That won't change whether they go and get a marquee signing or decide to stick with with what we got. Yeah, absolutely. So a few things that I've noticed, I'm keen to get your insight on. Genji, Ellis Genj as captain. I mean, I would never have had him down as a captain, but for me, he would have been one of the first names on the team sheet as a Leicester and even England to a degree. I'll be honest with you, I, I love Genji. What's he like as a captain? Mate, he's class. It's, it's been quite, you know, people turn around and say, oh, how's the club changed since you were last You were last at the club? And uh, me and Genji have been good mates for, for years, so he's a top bloke. And he was, he was still a boy, like he just signed for Bristol. We'd had a few issues with um, Andy Robinson. Uh, he came in, he was just sort of finding his feet. And then suddenly you come back and you expect it to be the Genji of old, you know, still that sort of a little bit immature, you know, but you come now and he's he's a real man. You know, he's, he's got a kid now. Um, he's just matured a lot. And I think with me, Jim, and talking to you, and I know you're a, a captain of mine and I don't want to blow smoke up your ass, mate. But for me, the best captains, yourself, Tom Youngs, Ellis Genji, they're the guys that when shit is the fan, they jump straight in. They got your back. But at the same time, if people step out of line, if something's not right, they'll they'll correct it. So um, you know, you know, when you co- when you um captain the gym, no, I was young, quite cocky. You know, if one of the senior boys did something out of line, you'd be the first to sort of clip them around the ear and get and get them back in line. But also, if I was being a dick, you'd be like, mate, you're being a dick. Do you know what I mean? So. Sometimes no, no, absolutely, yeah. This whole, um, this whole sort of, there's a handbook of what you should do as a captain, what you should say, what you should do. But for me, the best captains are those that lead, you know, with the heart and sometimes with their sponge fist, Jim. Say, eh? you know what I mean? <laughs> well, exactly. <laughs> but, but but I like someone who I know. So like, I'd follow Genji anywhere, mate. I will tell you that now. Like, I would genuinely, I would, you know, I would go to some dark places for that bloke because I love him as a bloke. And you know, one thing at Leicester is that I've really enjoyed is the family side of it after games, you know, having a little lounge where all the families are and you come in and to, you know, I know Genji's parents, his missus, his kid. And, and so because of that, you have a lot more of a collective bond as a group. So someone like Genji, mate, he doesn't need to say anything. He just needs to be himself and people will follow him. And I think that's what Steve saw in him is people buy into it and um, mate, top bloke. And you know, he's a, he's a good captain as well. And, Sorry to waffle on, but he's got obviously a wealth of experience around him with guys like Coley. You know, you've got um, Julian um, Hooker, uh, Montero. I've always, I always get him. Yeah, I always Montoya. I did the big game the week in Italy, Argentina. Montoya or Montoya or Montana. Do you know what? I feel really bad, but we've got obviously Tute Moroni as well. And I always, before I came, was getting their names mixed up, which is obviously not good. But you've got, you've got Julian, who's obviously a captain in Argentina at the minute. Um, you've got Ben Youngs, who's a 100-odd cap international. You've got Fordy there at the minute. You've got someone like Namani on the wing. There's leadership all around the place. So um, he's, in, he's in good company with, um, with that. And I think that probably takes the pressure off him having to always be articulate and well-spoken. He just has to be himself. And tell me about some of the young lads, uh, Fred. I did a documentary on the Leicester Tigers Academy maybe three years ago. And there was a couple of lads that I picked out that was like, these are going to be stars. George Martin was one. And then yeah. Freddie Stewart was the other one. Just at, both athletically gifted, uh, which you obviously need now. But you mentioned some of the senior players that you've got there. One thing that I've been so impressed with from Steve Borthwick and the coaches, but also from um, the standpoint of how they've taken to anything that's been put in front of them. Just give us a kind of a few lines on Freddie Stewart and some of the kind of young lads, Harry Potter, the wizard, you know, Dan Kelly in the centre. Like these players that people wouldn't have known about a year ago or two years ago, but are now on the tip of everyone's tongues, especially someone like Freddie. Yeah, well, for me, I, I said it. I remember watching Freddie 
Um, I was on the bench against Exeter first game of the season. I can't remember who was sat next to me, but he's got test match written all over him. Like he's a test match, his game is test match level. Um, unbelievably solid under the high ball. He reminds me, mate, he's like, for me, he's like a perfect blend between like a, a Matt Perry back in the day. He was just unbelievable. Old school. Yeah, unbelievable under the high ball. But then like a Mike Brown, someone who's got the ability to stay on their feet, break a few tackles. And it's great to see Freddie going, um, going well for England. Um, and he's still got so much more development left in him. Same with, there was that exciting thing, Dan Kelly's another one. Like, you know, you you got obviously cap for England in the summer. Um, but no one would really have known too much about him. But just a solid player. And I said this to my family, I was sort of, this is one of the most solid squads I've played in, in terms of um, strength and depth. You know, you look at the back row of, you know, you can go uh, Andrew Liebenberg, Marco Van Staden, Jasper Visa, but then you've got young lads like Oli Chesham, you've got um, George Martin, you've got Tommy Raphael. Yeah. You know, I'm probably missing out a few boys, but, you know, you've got these, you've got these players that are just, whether they're young or a little bit more experienced, can come in and they, and they do a job. And we have a game plan and a very um, clear vision that when boys step in, they know what's expected. And what's expected is not the same either. So, for instance, if uh, if an Oli Chesham comes in for a Handro Liebenberg, he's not expected, Oli Chesham as a youngster is not expected to play like Handy. He's expected to deliver the game plan, but also bring what he brings, if that makes sense. So no one's trying to replicate each other. When I play at 10, I'm not trying to be George Ford, but I know the game plan and I know what's expected of me and that's what I need to bring. Let's talk a little bit about England. Good win against Australia. Um, just the way that it kind of fell uh, with uh, Marcus Smith starting at 10, obviously uh, Faz at 12 with Faz missing the game before with COVID. Do you like the balance of this England team now? Like everyone's talking about Marcus Smith. You're probably well placed to talk about him more than I am. Fordy has been standout. It almost feels like if Fordy had played that well, and they say that, you know, Leicester obviously on the front foot now, so it's very, very different to how it was before, would arguably still be starting to 10, but it seems like it's a new era. Marcus Smith's been pushed in, held back, held back, and it feels like now is his chance and his moment. Like, how good is he? Is he as good as we're all making out, Freddie? Or is there a few things, do you need to see this game against South Africa to really see if he's got the ability to, to cement that position down? No, I think he's. I think he's very good. Um, obviously, I think you know. Last year, especially, he was the best ten in the Premiership by um, by a country mile. Um, for me, yeah, it will be interesting. And I, you know, people have been sort of piling this pressure on and calling for him to play for England. But you know, Quins were terrible up until Christmas last year. They only started finding their form sort of during the Six Nations. So there's no opportunity there for him to play. For, do you know what I mean you know people are saying, "Oh, he's got to play for England. Got to play for England." He's, he's gone in pretty much as soon as he could or as soon as Eddie could get him in there. Um, but this week, I really liked it the weekend, him in Faz. Um, I thought the balance was good. He seems to have been given a licence to, to to bring his own game and sort of bounce around a little bit, which is good. Um, you know, and it'll be interesting what happens Saturday against the Springboks, especially with Faz now being out. Suddenly, a lot more pressure goes on to Marcus Smith to, to run that game. So it'll be interesting, but I do think he's the real deal, mate. I think he'll develop, and I think um, he needed to have his opportunity. Um, but that said, you cannot ignore how good George Ford's been this year. Like it's, it, it mate, it's such a like I wouldn't want to be Eddie Jones to be fair because. Do you think there's I'm, any chance with Fordy getting back in or not? Just like, because it does feel like it's closed now. So if you think that Faz is injured, right, and they've not called Fordy in. To the squad. I know it's only one game, so you can yeah. look at it like that. But you know what Eddie's like? He's done it, you know, it's almost like, mate, you're done. That's it. You know, same with Dylan, same with Rob Shaw. And I know them guys were probably at a different stage in their career to where Ford is, because Ford is fucking carving up, as we've just said. Yeah. Does it feel like it's a closed door for him? Um, I don't know. I I you know, I think you could definitely have a squad with with both Marcus and George in, whether I don't think Eddie sees Faz as a 10 particularly. I think obviously he sees him as a as a 12, which is why I'd imagine Fordy's not been called in for this this weekend. Um, it's hard, isn't it? Because you almost 
can't leave Farrell out of the team is is not the issue, but that's that's where so you can't leave Faz out of the team if he's fit because of the he's the captain, he's he's the leader. And then where do you go? Do you do you, you know, Fordy's had 70 odd caps now, I think it is. Has Eddie seen enough to maybe give Marcus Smith a chance, what which he deserves? Um it's hard. Either way, I think Eddie now has to do what he's done, which is back Marcus. And if Marcus is where he wants to go, he has to six nations. We have to see Marcus Smith in at 10 for England. Next summer, we need to see Marcus Smith at 10 for England. And what do you think? Who do you think will win at the weekend? And if England do win, where does that leave them, do you think, in terms of conversations going forward to the six nations this year? Because they, you know, they were poor last year. I think, I think it'll be tight. I think England... I think England will win. Um, I just feel like they might have something up their sleeve this week that they'll bring that's just a little bit different. And obviously with Marcus Smith there, you have to use his skill set. Um, God, it's a hard gym. It's so hard to call, isn't it, mate, to be honest with you. I think England will win purely because of home advantage and I feel like they'll carry the ball that much harder and maybe dominate collisions that much more. Um, but I think it's going to be tight, mate. It'll be one score either way. Um, as for how they do that, mate, anyone's guess. Like, yeah, absolutely. Because what can you do? What's a set piece absolutely. like? You go in a set piece or not, mate? They absolutely hosed Scotland in the scrum and Wales and line out and breakdown. And I, I think you, with all the best intentions you have, like I think England are going to win. I think South Africa look a little bit tired. You yeah. look at some of the players they're missing, Chesson Colby, Peter Steph to Toy, in terms yeah. of their best player. You know, they're arguably thin um, at scrum half. Kobus Reinach will come back in. Yanchis was average at the weekend. Uh, both of them were. You know, Pollard will come back in. They just look a little bit tired, but they're yeah. still winning. Uh, and I just think, I look at England, I look at Underhill, I look at Curry. Um, yeah. I think Don Brand should start at eight, but I think, you know, you know Eddie's life will probably st- stick with Curry at eight. Yeah. But I just think it's not the making of the player or the man of Marcus Smith. He's a fantastic player. But I think the quality that England have got in terms of Freddie Stewart at fullback, I agree with you with Max Malins. Johnny May isn't as good under the high ball, but you've got two world-class players under the high ball. Manu looks yeah. lean, he looks fit. And I just think that England, you look at all the other teams, on paper, have got a better, have got the team that can beat South Africa. So, yeah. The only thing I would say, Jim, is if you watch that, um, you watch that, is it Chasing the Sun or whatever, the South African documentary? Oh, good. So good. But did you see in the final, and this is why I think this will be, this won't be the making or breaking of Marcus Smith by any stretch, but did you see how they targeted 40 in that final? And, I, you know, in the semi-final against New Zealand, 40 was England's best player, arguably England's best player for that whole World Cup. Yet, South Africa are very good at picking one, two, three key players from the opposition and just going after them. So I reckon they'll go after Itoji. I reckon they'll go after Smith and just try and dismantle England that way. And, you know, unfortunately now, this is where it'd be so interesting to watch is with the way Farrell controls the team, with him out, that extra pressure on Smith to have to manage a game that's going to be stop-start, it's going to be physical. He's probably not going to have as much time as he did at the weekend. You know, it's going to be interesting to see how England manage that. It's interesting, isn't it, when you look at Ireland? Because the big question is that fly-off. You know, yeah. Sexton, being the age that he is, and obviously he's one of them players that, like Richard McCaw, do you know what I mean? It doesn't matter. Yeah. However, you know, if you're playing at 60% or you're 67% fit, you're in, you're that important to the team. But it is interesting, isn't it? I mean, you look at them uh, out of Carberry, obviously your brother. Harry Byrne seems to be the one that they're talking about as well. I don't know how much of Irish rugby have you seen. Like, who, who do you think should succeed Sexton? So, so here's my thinking on it, Jim, right, is obviously my little brother's 27. Joey Carberry's got to be 28, 29. Yeah, he's had a couple of injuries. Yeah, I'm not too sure as well. He's Carty, missed a couple of years, didn't he? Carty's a similar age, in a similar age bracket. So is Ross Byrne. So if they're thinking Sexton for the next two years up until the World Cup, right, after that World Cup in two years' time, are you going to want to bring in a 10 who is late 20s, early 30s? Or are you going to want to go for a Harry Byrne, who I think he's only, he's got to be low 20s, between 21 and 22? 
Um, but do you then want to hand the reins over to a young 10 like that who's had a bit of experience and can then take Ireland forward again over eight, nine years? Um, that's where I'm sort of thinking is they need to give probably Harry Byrne um, a run of games and expose him to that level. Because you look at you look at all the young 10s, you look at someone like James O'Connor when he first came into the scene real young, was terrible for the first five, 10 caps, but then become accustomed to that level and ends up being a world-class player. Do you know what I mean? So I feel like there's a there's a bit of a dilemma there with who they hand the reins over in terms of age-wise. Do you hand them over for two years and then go with a cycle of changing your 10 every couple of years because boys are getting over the hill or do you get someone in young and try and have a sexton effect? Best 10 in the world at the minute. Who is it? And I know that your thinking would might be slightly different to other people's. Great to see Quay Cooper back in the mix. Obviously, Bowden Barrett's been playing 10. I commentated yeah. on Italy, New Zealand, Richie Mwanga, um, who I've, apparently isn't in the form that he was um, last year. But best 10 in the world now. Go. Let's, let, let's open this up to the rugby pass viewers and listeners and people that want to type and, and put their comments into the mix. Jesus, Jim. If pretty easy had... question, is it not? It's a pretty easy, like, best 10 in the world now. Who is it? No. I'll tell you what, Jim, and because I'll tell you who I love at 10. I genuinely like, I think he's class, I love it. Is Intermac. But then he's been playing 12 for France, and he outside yeah. Jacques Bet. But like, if I was picking a team now, I would want I, I just love the way Intermac plays the game. Like, so is he statistically and in form the best 10 in the world right now? Probably not. But is he the 10 that I would pick? Yeah. But I think now if I was going to inform 10s in the world. You can't, you can't go past 40, mate. Like, you know, he's he's been kicking, you know, been kicking 20-odd points a game consistently, um, driving the team around the pitch. So, right now, in terms of in-form 10s, you can't go too far wrong with George Ford. Lovely chatting to you on All Access, Rugby Pass. Enjoyed that, buddy. And uh, good luck in the season with Leicester. Uh, who knows, Fred? Mate, the stars might align. You might carve up back in the England team, when they play New Zealand in the World Cup, single-handedly beat the All Blacks. It could happen again. Mate, could, hey, Jim, a boy can dream. That's all he can do.